Let's turn then to the book of Exodus and chapter 20. And we've just begun a study on the Ten Commandments, and we find them written there in Exodus and chapter 20, and that's on page 83 in the Church Bible if you're using it, page 83. You'll remember that these words, the Ten Commandments, were spoken audibly by God himself from the top of Mount Sinai. So bearing that in mind, at verse 1, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And particularly these words of verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. Now, I introduced the Ten Commandments uh, last Lord's Day, and there were some things in connection with the introduction that I just thought best maybe to leave and to pick up as we work our way through the commandments. But in coming to this first commandment, there's actually something that really belongs to an introduction, because believe it or not, there are quite a lot of people who dispute whether this really is the first commandment. Now, that may seem a little bit strange, but there is a genuine debate about what the first commandment is. And the fact of the matter is that uh, Jews and Roman Catholics have a different way of numbering the commandments. Now, that doesn't mean that they number them in the same way. In fact, they don't. The Jewish way of numbering them is not the same as the Roman Catholic, but neither of them number them as we are familiar with them. Now, of course, there may be some people in here today who are not at all familiar with the Ten Commandments, but I know that a good number of you are and that you've learned them uh, probably since uh, childhood. You've known them since childhood, and you're used to numbering them and thinking of them just like that. You shall have no other gods as being the first commandment, and the second commandment you shall not make for yourself a carved image, and so on. But the Jews and the Catholics differ, and let me just briefly explain how. The Jews consider that the first saying, or the first word, is in verse 2. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For them, that is the first saying. And then they combine the next two commandments into one. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. In other words, they understand both these commands there to be essentially saying the same thing, no idolatry. Roman Catholics have a different way of numbering the commandments. They also combine our first two. They take together, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself a carved image. They take both these to be a single command against idolatry. But then, in order to find ten commandments, What they do is they split up the tenth, as we are familiar with it. If you turn your page to verse 17, you'll come to what we are familiar with as the tenth commandment. Now, what the Roman Catholics do is that they actually break this up into two commandments, so that the first of them is, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. And then, because the words you shall not are repeated again, they take the second part as as the tenth commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, I don't know to what extent it's, it's worthwhile trying to refute that, because, to be quite honest, it seems fairly self evident to me what the ten commandments actually are. But let me say just a couple of things. First of all, the Jewish way of numbering the sayings 
Okay, in verse 2, you have a saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. But that does not sound like the rest. It's not the same form. And of course, it's certainly not a commandment. It is a saying and it's an important saying, but it is not a commandment. It seems to us like a preamble to the commandments. And what's really interesting in that connection is that in the last hundred years, Lots of documents have been uncovered from the ancient Near East. And many of them are treaties that were made between the overlord and the vassal. So that a a conquering overlord would impose his will on the vassal. In other words, uh, I will grant you protection and so on, but this is the tribute that you must serve me, and this is the law that you must keep. So it was a treaty imposed And the interesting thing about all these treaties is that they they followed a specific pattern. The overlord would begin by saying, this is who I am. This is my right to dictate the terms. And you must acknowledge my sovereignty over you. Now, is that not very revealing when it comes to this document here that belongs to the same place and to the same time in history? Before he stipulates the requirements, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. That is obviously a typical treaty preamble. So I think we can just discard the Jewish understanding of it. When it comes to the Roman Catholic understanding, they, of course, like I said, combine the first two commandments to be a simple prohibition against idolatry. Now, we'll see as we go on that it's very important to distinguish commandments one and two. They're not saying the same thing at all. The commandment that says you shall have no other gods before me is very different from the commandment that says that you shall not make a graven image for yourself. Very different commandments. But I hope you'll agree that the way that the Tenth Commandment is divided up into two is just really highly artificial. It's a highly artificial division. In in ten great commandments, why should you have two that are so similar? You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Why should that be apart from you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant? Um, I don't want to say any more about it than that because, as I said, I think it's fairly obvious. And I sometimes wonder if the desire to to combine commandments one and two uh, has led to that artificial division. Because, as you know, Roman Catholicism is full of carved images and so on in worship. And it wouldn't be if they properly understood the second commandment. But anyway, all that is by way of introduction and preamble. When we're going to study the first commandment today, we are going to study simply verse 3 and verse 3 alone. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, remember, too, from last Lord's Day that this you here is a you singular. Of course, that's easier to preserve in the 17th century language. Thou shalt not. You singular shall have no other gods before me. And every time we read the commandments, we're to take them personally like that. It's not talking to a generic people or a, or a nation. As such, it is addressing every single person in the world individually. So when I speak to you in the name of God, as by his grace I try to do today, I want you to take it in exactly the same way. God is telling you personally. You can put your own name on that. You can put your own name on it. He's telling you personally to make sure that you have no other gods before him. And just one more thing before we try and open up the commandment a little bit. You'll notice the words before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, when I was uh, growing up, I thought that that meant that I should have no other god um, ahead of Jehovah, no one first before him in priority. I didn't think that that necessarily meant that you could have other gods after him, but I still thought that's what it meant. You shall have no other god in first place. But the word before me is nothing to do with priority, actually. It's to do with physical location. 
You shall have no other gods, literally in the Hebrew, before my face. Before my face. Which is a graphic way of saying, in my presence. Now, actually, I think the words, in my face, convey a bit more than before my presence. And I'll say something about that in a moment. But that's the general meaning of it. You shall have no other gods in my presence. Now, of course, the the presence of God is everywhere in the highest sense. He is omnipresent. So it means, period, you shall have no other gods. Although, as I say, there is a reason for saying before my face. So no gods at all. A prohibition of idolatry. That's not what the second commandment is about, although it sounds like it, but it's very much what the first commandment is about. And of course, it raises the question right at the beginning, well, what does it mean uh, not to have an idol, or really, what is an idol? Idolatry is a term that I suppose we're familiar with, reasonably so, but maybe we're not really sure what it means. How would you define an idol? What is idolatry? Well, very simply, an idol is anyone or anything that takes the place that God should take in your life. It's as simple as that. You may have all kinds of convoluted ideas as to about what idolatry actually is, involving stones and sticks and eyes and objects and so on. But essentially in the Bible, as we'll see, idolatry is what happens when you put anyone or anything into the place that belongs to God in your life. And that refers to your time, uh, your space, uh, or your heart itself. Now, every commandment has its positive and its negative dimension. Uh, when, when, when you learnt these commandments as children, those of you who did, I'm sure you went through the routine like I did myself, what does the first commandment require? And what is forbidden in the first commandment? Same with the second. What's required by the second commandment? What's forbidden in the second commandment? It reminds us that there's a positive and a negative side all the time, even if they're not explicitly stated. Now, this commandment is just like that. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, there's obviously, implicitly there, a positive aspect to that. You shall have me as your God. Obviously, if we're to have no other gods before his face, it is plain that he must be our God. And why should that be so? Well, I suppose because of verse 2 and the preamble. Here is the overlord. I am the Lord your God. That's who I am. In fact, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage so you shall have no other gods before me. I am your God. Let me be your God or ensure that I am your God. So who is this God who demands your allegiance? Well, His names reveal him. I am Jehovah, your God, your Elohim. First of all, I am your God. Elohim is the most primitive title for God. And it just conveys the concepts of power and even uh, creatorhood. That he is the one who made and sustains all things. And it follows from that that you owe your life to him, not only in its origin, but in its ongoing sustenance. It's in him that you live and move and have your being, and apart from the will of God being positively exercised towards you, your existence would cease to be. You owe everything you have, everything you own, every thought you think, every breath you breathe, you owe to God. At all times. That's an important thing to remember. You'll remember um, Belshazzar, the last king of Babylon, on the night on which it fell to the Persians. Uh, Daniel was called out to read the famous writing on the wall. 
And amongst the many things that Daniel said to the king that night, he said that the God who holds your breath in his hand and who owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Now, uh, Belshazzar was a king who was notoriously proud and he was self-reliant and he made great play that evening of bringing the vessels that had been taken captive from God's temple in Jerusalem. He took them in from their own temple and he began to put them to a common and degrading use, to drink out of them and to be drunk. It was sacrilegious. It was blasphemous. It was contempt of God. And on this night in which he's going to die, uh, Daniel reminds him that it is God who holds your breath in his hand and who owns your ways, and you have not glorified him. And, and I want that single name, God, to remind you of all that. It reminds you of your duty to acknowledge your creator, your duty to serve your creator, to be at one with your creator, your duty to love your creator and to acknowledge that every breath you have is a gift from himself. The second thing about this God is that he is the Lord. I am Jehovah, your God, verse 2. The name Jehovah is very different from the name God because it's God's personal name. He has many titles like Almighty, uh, Lord of Hosts, God, but he has one personal name, and that is the name Jehovah. And you'll remember that Moses was given the meaning of that name. First of all, it means I am that I am, self-existent, eternal, unchangeable, but also a revelation of character. Jehovah means merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty. This God is a character. When we call him a creator, we're not to think of him as a force or a power, something impersonal like electricity. He is a person. He has mind from which we derive our own. And he has characteristics, personal qualities, which we ought to have too. The sad thing, of course, is that sin has come into our lives and distorted our character. We have ceased to function in the image of God, although we carry its ruined traces. And God is in the business in salvation of restoring us to that character so that we too become like God. But that is who he is, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, keeping mercy, forgiving, and by no means clearing the guilty. That is the God that we are to have, our creator, personal God, who also, one more thing, brought us out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. What I want you to notice about this particularly is that these qualities in God are qualities that have been exercised on your behalf. You've tasted the mercy and the goodness and the grace and the forgiveness of God. These are not just descriptions of a person you've never known. They're not real and true descriptions of a person that you've never met. They belong to the one who took you from the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. And for you, that was the description of the darkness in which you lived when you were a law to yourself. You were lawless as far as God is concerned. You lived to serve yourself. Perhaps your God was your own belly, as we'll see later on. But God intervened. There was a sacrifice made on your behalf. There was a Passover lamb slain. Blood, blood was sprinkled on the lintels of your hearts, and you were brought out of that death and corruption. You crossed the Red Sea of death, and you made your way into the promised land. You belonged to the people of God. 
That reminds you that these commandments here at this time are given to a Christian people. They are given to a redeemed people. They belong to everybody. You shall have no other gods before me is for you, 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 and you. But they belong here especially to the Christian. You of all people must have no other gods before me because not only did I make you, not only have I revealed my character to you, but I have shown my character to you in delivering you from so great a wrath. That's why people who say that the Christian is somehow liberated from the Ten Commandments are just not thinking straight. It's when you become a Christian that you begin to love these commandments and that that you understand that the whole of the Christian life is somehow about getting you back into conformity with them. Yes, true, you'll discover that you keep falling short of it, but that will always be your pain and it will always be your grief and it will be the longing of your heart to one day keep them perfectly as you will in the glory that is to come. And I think that helps us, actually, to see the importance of the expression before me at the end of the commandment. You shall have no other gods before me, or literally remember, before my face. Why does that become significant? Well, because to fail to give him his place involves insult. Insult to one who has been so gracious and kind and loving towards you. I can even apply that to the unconverted. I mean, you haven't experienced the grace of God in bringing you from darkness to light. Maybe that's the case. Maybe you don't have the love of God in your heart. You don't have spiritual desires and so on. Well, that may be so. But I still want you to remember that every sin you commit is in the face of a God who's still gracious towards you. Uh, People speak of common grace disparagingly just because it's not saving grace. Well, of course, it's way less than saving grace, but it's still grace. For the God whom you have offended and still keep offending every single day to be lavishing you with the money you have, the clothes you have, the house you have, the friends you have, the health you've got, the family you've got, the Christian friends you've got, the Christian witnesses you've got, These things are powerful goodnesses from God. And it's before the face of that God that you then make your other gods and serve your other gods. It's before the face of that God that you take his money and make it your God. That you take the family that he gave you and make it your God. Or whatever else you make your God. Before my face. But how much more applicable is that for the Christian when God has shown his face towards you, not just in a way of common grace, which is abundant, but saving grace, the light of his countenance in Jesus Christ. He looked upon you in him in great favor. He stooped down in his love and mercy, stood in the curse where you should stand to bring you up to the blessing where you had no right to be. And in front of that face, can you sin? In front of that face, can you be guilty of idolatry? In front of the face of the Lord Jesus Christ? In front of the face who was crucified? The face that was spat upon, buffeted, and abused? Before that face, can you sin? You shall have no other gods before my face. Now, before looking at this commandment a little more positively, I want to see with you that um, if we don't make God our God, if we don't positively acknowledge the Lord our God as our God, then we will make an idol of something else. We will give to something or someone else the place that belongs to God. That's just bound to happen. Somebody once said a long time ago that the human heart must prostrate itself at someone's shrine, and that is true. And something or someone will have the place that God ought to have, possibly even yourself. 
But I'd like to think with you just for the time that we have left of um, some common ways in which this commandment is breached. Some are obvious, some less so. Let's take first polytheism, which is the belief in many gods, spiritual deities, supernatural deities. The Romans have a pantheon of them, as do the Greeks, as do the Celts, and so on. Many lords and many gods. The belief that there are competing semi-gods or demigods out there who are somehow involved in the processes of this world. It's not as common polytheism, perhaps, as it used to be, but it can sometimes disguise itself in another way. Um, Many people who were polytheists were really worshippers of nature, and what they would do was say, personify nature or give nature certain qualities and attributes. So uh, when they would create a god of some kind, it would perhaps be nothing more than the sun or the moon or perhaps even the wind or something of that kind. They were personifications of the power of nature. So in a way, you would almost say that such a kind of polytheism was the worship of nature itself. But that takes me to a, a more interesting form of breaking this commandment, which is pantheism, which is the belief that everything is a manifestation of God. Everything is divine. There are touches of that in Hinduism and Buddhism, and everything is to be worshipped. They invest the whole of the universe with a transcendent kind of quality. It's all divine. So, Strictly speaking, you you would treat everything with reverence, whether it was a piece of paper or uh, the smallest insect or, or anything at all, because it is all divine. Now, the strange thing is that the very opposite of that, in a way, is what you would call a materialist, which is what we see around us a lot. The materialist believes that there's only one stuff in the universe, too, but it's, it's absolutely not divine. It's simply matter. So, so that's where the materialist and the pantheist are apparently miles apart. The pantheist says, yes, there's only one thing really, but it's divine. The materialist says there's only one thing really, and it's not divine at all. And uh, most people who are deeply committed to a, a wide evolutionary theory would be of that kind of view. Now, the thing is that Pantheists, now here's where it becomes quite interesting. Pantheists are on a kind of crusade uh, to turn materialists into pantheists. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Those people who believe that everything is actually divine are saying to ordinary materialists, look, you're right in thinking there's only one stuff in the world. But, but your view of it is so low because you don't recognize its transcendent quality. You, you need to rethink the world so that you don't think of it as just being stuff, but being divine. And that's why you sometimes find a kind of push, even amongst materialists, to start using the language of awe and grandeur when you contemplate the universe. Now, to be honest, I mean, I'm quite happy to have an argument with you about this, but I think it's quite inconsistent to use words like awe and grandeur if this is not made. If all this has just happened, I I don't think there's any point in using terms like awe and grandeur. Awe and grandeur certainly, to me, convey the idea that somebody's involved in it, that there's something in, in it that ought to produce such awe and grandeur, rather than simply it is. It is, doesn't really produce awe and grandeur. But there's this increasing move to kind of invest this world with some kind of almost a supernatural glow. You sometimes find it when the, when the great high, high priests of materialists are commenting on uh, television programs, the chief of them being David Attenborough, who is 
certainly very good at his job and very talented and skillful, but his hushed tones are particularly good at cultivating this kind of idea of near reverence as, as you look at the world of nature, um, as though it almost is a, a, a godly thing or a godlike thing. I was on a website not that long ago which was calling all materialists to be in utter awe at, at the world in which they live. And I thought to myself, well, what's going on here? What's going on here? Are you actually somehow acknowledging deep down that there, there is a problem with your view? What are you calling us to be in awe about? A series of meaningless accidents doesn't produce awe. Only design produces awe. And the one thing this world seems to teach me, and I hope you too, is design. So you have polytheism, many gods. You have pantheism, everything's a god. Materialists, uh, nothing's a god. But um, the materialist can't live like that. Something has to become a god. Now, it's far more likely that one of your problems lies in another area. One of all our problems lies in another area. Let me just take one or two examples for you, and we'll just leave it at that. The first, most likely way in which you're breaching this today is that you may be a humanist. A humanist makes man the measure of all things. Our reason is the judge of everything. We decide what is right, and we decide what is wrong. The power we use, of course, our reason, makes us rationalists, but we are rationalists because we are humanists. It is humankind that lies at the top of the evolutionary chain. And so we have a right to pronounce, to legislate, and to move forward. Now, making man the measure of all things is nothing new. In fact, that's the original sin in the Bible. And when man tries to build his world on humanistic principles, the result is Babylon. You'll notice that Babylon appears in Genesis 11 for the first time in the form Babel, the Tower of Babel, and it continues right through to Revelation 19, where the city is at last destroyed. Babylon, incidentally, means confusion. And confusion is exactly what happens when humanists try to build cities and create civilizations with man at their center. Confusion. Uh, the root of that, and the root of the Tower of Babel itself in Genesis 11... Uh, I don't know how much to assume. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure many of you will have heard of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, <laughs> put very simply, was the first uh, human civilization, really. It was the first attempt by fallen man to form a civilization without God at its center. It was led by a man called Nimrod, and all the peoples of the earth basically moved as one. They gathered around uh, the area that we now call Babylon, and they built a city with a focal point at the center, and this was to celebrate man and his achievements. Now, the reason that happened in the first place, well, you just have to go back a few chapters and the fall of man. When Satan came before man, Adam and Eve, he, he basically said to them, um, stretch out your hands and eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil, of the knowledge of good and evil. And remember, you shall be gods. You shall be gods, knowing good and evil for yourselves. Now, what a stunning promise that was. Like everything the devil says, it's got an element of truth. The devil wouldn't be so hard to catch if he was just a bare-faced liar. But he always comes with a half-truth. Your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The poison came in, and, and with that reach, the desire is to be, well, to be lords of themselves. 
to be their own masters. Does that not describe you today? Uh, Maybe it's not how you're feeling right now. I hope it isn't. Maybe God has been intervening in your life to make you think differently. But up till now, have you not wanted to be master of your own destiny? Maybe even growing up in a Christian home, have you not felt, oh, I'd like to be free of this. I'd like to be short so I could uh, plan my own life and make my own way. And I, I really don't want anyone telling me what to do. It's the prevailing ethic of the world. I mean, you hear it on countless TV programs. You see it in magazines. And don't tell me what to do. It's so hard. I mean, you, you even try and tell people about Christianity and the need to be saved, and they say, that's fine for you, not me. And don't impose your religion on me. And if you try to say, well, I'm not posing my religion, please. I am trying to introduce you to this word of God. You say, no, I'm my own master. I have a right to govern my own body. I have a right to govern my own mind. I, I, I. And you see, you wonder how we break this first command, you shall have no other gods before me. I have a right to govern my body. I have a right to govern my mind. I am my own master. That was exactly what happened when they took the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a way of saying, we don't want to be subject anymore. Let us decide what's good. Let us decide what's evil. Let us have the knowledge base to make these judgments ourselves. We are able to make them. We are competent to make them. We have a right to make them. Humanism, humanistic Adam, humanistic Eve, and the humanistic children of Adam and Eve, everywhere. And then that's manifested in building the Tower of Babel, and so on down throughout history. Uh, just to take a, 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 another interesting example of that, if you're familiar with uh, Daniel's vision, it wasn't Daniel's, um, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, when he saw uh, the four kingdoms of the ancient world, the Babylonian kingdom, the Persian kingdom, the Greek kingdom, and the Roman kingdom, uh, gold, silver, bronze, and iron with a mixture of clay, and these were the successive kingdoms of the earth. And then, of course, you saw the little stone uh, being cut out of a mountain without a man's hand. That's the supernatural origin of it. And this little stone hits this statue on its legs and it's blasted away to, the, to smithereens. And, and the stone, the kingdom of Christ, grows and grows until it fills the whole world. Now, the interesting thing about that image is that it's in the form of what? A man, a man, the head of it is gold, the chest is silver, the belly and the arms are bronze, and the legs are iron. A man. Why? Because every successive human empire is a humanistic empire. All the empires we build, and the cities we make, and the law codes that we write, the legislation that we pass, it's all humanistic. It's to glorify and exalt man, his rights, and his achievements. That's what it's all about, you see. But the kingdom of Christ blows these humanistic empires into smithereens. And humanism and Christianity are just directly opposed to each other like that. And that needs to happen in your own heart. There's a humanistic empire in here. And this stone needs to hit into it. The Lord Jesus Christ's word, like a hammer, needs to break that heart of yours, that empire that you're building for yourself, and that name and that reputation. When they built the Tower of Babel, what did they say? Let us make a name for ourselves. What an astonishing thing to say. But don't you hear it so often? In one form or another, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's get a reputation Let's get people's awe. Let's get people's admiration. Humanism. It was, an, it was an interesting thing, but in the following chapter, when God calls Abraham, he said to him, I will make your name great. That's a, that's a peculiar thing, but it's a contrast. In Babel, let us make a name for ourselves. Then suddenly God calls Abraham out of darkness and says, 
I will make your name great. Um, You seek the name that comes from God. Let God look after your reputation. You look after your character. Let God look after your reputation. He'll write your name in heaven, and he will declare your righteousness. You be content with that. Uh, Don't start seeking humanistic glory in any way. So humanism, humanism is one of the ways in which this commandment is broken. A second way is love of pleasure. Love of pleasure. Paul, in writing to the Philippians, says, um, I'm telling you now, he says, weeping about people who, who once followed, but now he says their God is their belly. He means by that just the appetites, food, drink, sexuality. People who would much rather be filled with wine than be filled with the Spirit of God. Which would you prefer? Honestly. Paul says to the Ephesians, don't be drunk any longer with wine, he said, but be filled with the Spirit. Let the Spirit of God give you in your life the things that drink perhaps gave you before. Don't be, don't be uh, given over to drink, but rather be filled with the Spirit, which would be your choice. Again, are you happier sitting at a feast in this world or sitting at a gospel table? Or again, would you rather be joined in sexual union to someone else rather than have a union between your spirit and the Lord's? Uh, Don't get me wrong. God's the author of pleasure. I know, I know, thinking or listening to some people, you'd think that he was not, but of course he is. God gave the gift of sexual union to man and woman. God gave the gift of wine. Psalm 104 tells us that it's to make his heart glad, to lift up his countenance, not to be drunk with. It's God's gift. Food is God's gift. But when you love the pleasure these things give you more than God itself, they are your idols. And you have another God before himself. In 1 Timothy 3, we read of people who are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The sad thing is, when God is at the heart of your life, all pleasures become real. Um, It's better not to make the discovery. It's better not to make it. But if you make it, you'll make it, uh, that all the pleasures in this world are not what they're cracked up to be. They all have a sting in their tail. But when God comes into your life, every pleasure becomes right and proper and better than they are without God. I want to say that especially to young people because I, I know that the force is always on you to say, oh, this is what you really need to make you happy. Well, I don't know how easy or how hard you might find it to to take from me, but it's just not. Uh, From the Word of God, it's not. It's false. It's deceptive. And the sting is always in the tail. If, If you take that kind of life with you, it'll break you. It will break you. And if you say to God, govern my pleasures, help me to have sexual purity in the right way, help me to eat in a disciplined way, to drink in a disciplined way, just to live in a disciplined way, you'll discover that there's pleasure in these things when they're done properly. Because it's God's way. I mean, God made you. God knows you. It's God's way, and that's the way it works. Satan always misleads you. I'm sure I told you the story before about the man who was... It's a, it's a, it's a fable. It's a fable, but fable, fables have their uses. Um, about the man who was on top of a mountain and... Uh, the snake on top of the mountain said, can you please take me down? I'm freezing. He said, can you take me down from the top of the mountain? And the man said, no. He says, I know what you're like. You, you, you'll, once I take you close, you'll bite me. You'll kill me. And the snake said, no. He said, I'm freezing up here on the mountain. Freezing. Will you please take me down? So eventually the man took the snake and put him inside his jacket and took him down to the bottom of the mountain. And then just when he was about to let the snake go, the snake just turned around and bit him. And the man said, you, you promised me. And the snake said, you knew what I was before you took me up. You knew what I was before you took me up. So I want you to remember that too. 
Whenever you choose sin with all its promises about how it won't break you, it won't destroy you, you know what it is before you pick it up. You know what it is. And don't turn round surprised at the end of the day that what your ministers told you and your elders told you and your father and your mother told you, don't be surprised because sin doesn't make peace treaties. It just doesn't do it. The other way in which you could break this command without realizing it too much is with a love of money. Again, money is a gift to be used wisely and is something of great blessing and benefit to those who have it and those who receive it from others who have it. But the Bible still tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil, or literally all kinds of evil, I think is how we should translate that. And again, we're told in the New Testament that covetousness is idolatry. That's what Paul says. Notice how the Tenth Commandment somehow just come back, comes back in a circle to the first. The first commandment, no other gods before me. The Tenth, don't covet, which Paul says is idolatry. Now, that's because your lust for things has become so great that it takes the place of God. You need to watch that. This dependence upon consumerism, materialism, the need to shop, retail therapy, as we politely call it, because we have different ways of describing things that are sins to make them not so bad. We all know that. Uh, Lies are being economical with the truth. Adultery is an affair. Uh, And so it goes on. Retail therapy, well, okay, I'm not, not knocking everything that can pass for that, but you know what I mean. Is it the case that you're frequently down and only a splurge will cure it? Well, where's God in that? Where is God in that? The other thing is an excessive love for people or a misplaced love for people. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 37, whoever loves husband or wife more than me is not worthy of me. And that too is a very, very searching thing. It is easy to put people where God should be. Maybe you're not a Christian because of what people think. Is that true? Maybe you haven't professed faith because of fear of what people think. What does that say, really? What does that say in the light of, you shall have no other gods before my face? When someone else's influence is restraining you from obedience to that God. We need to think about that. The commandments are broad. Broader always than we realize. Sometimes said to people that it's easier to keep God's commands yourself than to get your children to keep them. I've seen many people collapse when it comes to raising their children who are quite careful with themselves. Sometimes a temptation may come to you to perhaps may do something like maybe go to a nightclub or whatever and you say, no, I'm not going to do that. But then... Perhaps your son or daughter grows and they're 15 or 16 or something like that and they say, well, I want to go and I want to go to this or whatever and you start to crack. You wouldn't go and play football yourself on Sunday, but your child friend has a best friend has a birthday party on Sunday and slowly you think, well, maybe just once I can just go to the party. You see, you wouldn't dream of going just once yourself, but... It's your child, you see. Sometimes our love for them can be so great. Well, but is it really love? Is it really love or is it indulgence when we are actually prepared to bend the commands of God in order to make them happy? Will it really make them happy? Whoever loves father or mother, wife, son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, I'm closing with this, Um, you're not finished with this commandment the day you become a Christian. 
In other words, you can't just turn around and say, right, now that I am a believer and I've yielded myself to the Lord. It doesn't mean that you can say, right, I don't need to worry about that commandment anymore. You do. You do need to worry about it. You need to worry about it the most today who do not know the Lord your God as the Lord your God. But you also need to worry about it today if for some reason he's not on the throne in some kind of way in which he should be. If you have just put something else there, just maybe for a time. First John is one of the most beautiful, uh, loving letters in the whole of Scripture, but it ends on an interesting note. The epistle of love ends on this note. The last verse in First John, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, he's talking to Christians, it's a term of endearment that John used, little children, keep yourselves from idols. And I don't suppose that there is any better way of dealing with this than just by going home ourselves and asking ourselves, are there any idols today in my heart? Let us pray. <clears throat> Our gracious God, we pray to remember that we are always before your face and that it is a face that has been gracious towards ourselves. Help us then to guard ourselves from idols before that gracious face. And we pray that we would be ready to look at ourselves rather than at others. It is easy sometimes to misunderstand other people's actions and the reasons for doing them. It is easy too to cover up our own and to excuse ourselves when we have no right to be excused. Help us daily to consecrate ourselves to you, to ensure that nothing inhabits the throne of our heart except our glorious Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. May we be altogether yours. In his name, amen. Our last psalm is Psalm 86 on page 341. Page 341, Psalm 86, at verse 8, and we're singing to the tune Ayrshire. Lord, there is none among the gods that may with thee compare, and like the works which thou hast done, not any work is there. All nations whom thou madest shall come and worship reverently before thy face, and they, O Lord, thy name shall glorify. Because thou art exceeding great, and works by thee are done which are to be admired, and thou art God thyself alone. Teach me thy way, and in thy truth, O Lord, then walk will I. Unite my heart, that I thy name may fear continually. That's a very interesting prayer, that, and I've thought a couple of times of preaching on it, but I, I never have done but Unite my heart. He's conscious of things going in different directions and he wants them bound, that I, thy name, may fear continually. 